Good morning, and the Lord be with you. It is good to be gathered here on this Lord's Day, and it's November. How that happened, I don't know, but anyway. So we have some November announcements, uh, things coming up. So November 16th is the game night, which is coming up at 6.30. For all ages, all are welcome. Uh, it's community game night, anybody, bring a friend. Uh, it's a good time for all. Also, the, uh, the session of Hebron has called a congregational meeting. Please note that for the 24th, directly after our worship service, so around noon on the 24th for the purpose of electing officers. So each year in November, or sometimes in December, we have a congregational meeting to elect our new elders, deacons, our budget committee, and our nominating committee for the following year. So these will be folks beginning to serve in 2025. So just be aware of that, that's coming up, that's the Sunday before Thanksgiving. And then um, don't forget on the 17th, the week before that, we're gonna be having our birthday brunch. And there's a lot of information there as well as a sign up on the back table about that. So Tej, is there anything more that needs to be said about that? Yeah, so please sign up, and for those watching online, if you're going to be here that day, but you're not here to sign the pad, you can send an email to the office or to me or somebody, um, and uh, we'll make sure that to get you on that list uh, as well. Um, are there any other announcements for the good of everyone here? Of course, we have our ongoing mission uh, giving for the foster uh, children as well up here. If you have more questions about that, there's an insert in the bulletin about that. And the, you, all, you all made it, and you're not an hour early, so that's a good thing. Yes, good job. Any others? Okay, well then let's prepare our hearts and minds uh, for worship with the music of the prelude. Let us pray. Gracious God, we give thanks for this day that you have made, and we give thanks for the sunshine. We give thanks for all the blessings that you have poured out upon us and ask now that by the power of your spirit, you would open our hearts and minds uh, to all that we have to sing, say, and do, and learn this day. And might it be honoring to you. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. Please join me in the call to worship. Praise the Lord. Praise God in his sanctuary. Praise him in his mighty heavens. Praise him for his acts of power. Praise him for his surpassing greatness. Praise him with the sounding of the trumpet. 
Praise him with the harp and lyre. Praise him with timbrel and dancing. Praise him with the strings and pipe. Praise him with the clash of cymbals. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Let us stand and sing our opening song of praise. Come, Christians, join to sing number 108. Please be seated. The psalmist reminds us, the mercy of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting. With this assurance in mind, let us confess our sins to God. Almighty and merciful God, we have erred and strayed from your ways like lost sheep. We have followed too much the devices and desires of our own hearts. We have offended against your holy laws. We have left undone those things which we ought to have done, and we have done those things which we ought not to have done. O Lord, have mercy upon us. Restore us according to your promises, declared to the world in Christ Jesus our Lord. And grant, O merciful God, for his sake, that we may live a holy, just, and humble life to the glory of your holy name. Hear the good news. Who is in a position to condemn? only Christ. And Christ died for us. Christ rose for us. Christ reigns in power for us. Christ prays for us. Friends, believe the good news. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Let us share the peace of Christ with each other.
Please be seated. Our scripture passage this morning comes from Hebrews chapter 11. We're going to be looking at verses 1 to 16, which can be found on page 851 and 852 in the Pew Bible, if you'd like to turn and follow along. Uh, Before I read that, though, let me pray and ask for God's guidance and care as we read this together. Gracious God, we ask by your spirit you would inspire our hearts and minds just as you inspired the hearts and minds of the author many years ago. We ask that we might learn what we need to learn, that we would hear the words both of grace and mercy as well as those that challenge us to live more faithfully as your disciples. And may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable to you, O Lord, for indeed you are our rock and our redeemer. It's through Christ we pray. Amen. So Hebrews 11, now faith is confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see. This is what the ancients were commended for. By faith, we understand that the universe was formed at God's command so that what is seen was not made out of what was visible. By faith, Abel brought God a better offering than Cain did. By faith, he was commended as righteous. When God spoke well of his offering, and by faith Abel still speaks even though he is dead. By faith Enoch was taken from this life so that he did not experience death. He could not be found because God had taken him away. For before he was taken, he was commended as one who pleased God. And without faith it is impossible to please God, because anyone who comes uh, to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. By faith, Noah, when warned about things not yet seen, in holy fear, built an ark to save his family. By his faith, he condemned the world that became heir of the, and became heir of the righteousness that is keeping with faith. By faith, Abraham, when called to go to a place he would later receive as an inheritance, obeyed and went, even though he did not know where he was going. By faith, he made his home in the promised land like a stranger in a foreign country. He lived in tents, and as did Isaac and Jacob, who were heirs with him of the same promise. For he was looking forward to a city with foundations, whose architect and builder is God. And by faith, even Sarah, who was past childbearing age, was enabled to bear children because she considered him faithful, who had made the promise. And so from this one man, and, and, uh, and he as good as dead, came descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky and as countless as the sand on the seashore. All these people were still living by faith when they died. They did not receive the things promised. They only saw them and welcomed them from a distance, admitting that they were foreigners and strangers on earth. People who say such things show that they are looking for a country of their own. If they had been thinking of the country they had left, they would have had opportunity to return. Instead, they were longing for a better country, a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So I want to share a little secret with you all uh, about myself. I, I have uh, a pretty significant... I would say maybe even at times extreme fear of heights. I do. I've had it since I was a kid. It's just one of those things. Now, I've tried to overcome it over the years, and I've been somewhat successful, uh, although I still have this fear, um, and uh, Anderson has inherited it from me. Sorry, Anderson, yeah. Um, but that happens. Just to illustrate, especially in my younger days, how significant this fear of heights was, there was one time when we were traveling out west, and how many of you have been to the Royal Gorge Bridge, right? Royal Gorge Bridge, anybody? It's the highest suspension bridge in the United States of America. And we drove across it, and when we drove across it, I was fine. I was in the car, you know, I'm just in the old station wagon as we were driving around out west with our camping stuff and pulling our our camper and stuff. Uh, But... We got out on the other side, Dad drove back and, and parked the car, and then we were going to drive, draw, walk back across it. And if you've been on the Royal Gorge, I don't know if it's still this way, but I'd assume it is, but there's a, a significant flaw, in my opinion, <laughs> in the way that this thing was built, right? Because, like, 
you know, if you want to build something secure, you don't leave massive gaps in the boards that you're supposed to be driving and walking on, as far as I know. Assuming it's still the same today, I began to walk back across, and I had strategies, right? Just stay away from the railings, right? Walk down the middle and keep your head down and just walk, and that's what I would do, you know? That would keep me... Uh, but as I was walking across, I noticed that there were relatively large gaps between the boards that I was walking on that you could see straight down through to the gorge below and the river and all those things. And so I kind of panicked and went back and my parents had to kind of talk me down in order to get me finally to walk back across with them. And I did it. I did it finally. But uh, it took me some time to get the courage to do so. Uh, again, I, I've learned to overcome it by doing certain things and forcing me, uh, forcing myself to do them, right? So painting with my dad when I was uh, uh, younger. Um, he put me up on ladders and scaffolding and stuff like that, and he would just scramble up and down and didn't think anything of it. I'd get up there and I would like sit on the scaffolding and hold on for dear life with one hand and paint with the other, uh, whereas he was walking back and forth and going up and down and doing all those things, but I did it. I learned to love roller coasters, still do. Well, I don't go on them as much anymore, but you know, uh, I did always enjoy them. And then another thing that I did is some, uh, because I did youth ministry and my degrees and lots of outdoor ministry and camping and all that kind of stuff, I learned uh, to somewhat enjoy rock climbing and I've even rappelled. And now something you may know about rappelling, right, is that in rock climbing, you get this kind of at least a false sense of I'm the one holding myself to the rock, right? Like I'm the one holding on, even though you know you're being belayed and stuff like that. But if something were to go wrong, I can at least grab on and hold on, right? Like, but in rappelling, that's not the case. In rappelling, you're starting at the top and you're backing up over a cliff, right? That's what you have to do. And to rappel correctly, you have to kind of sit down and lean into it back over the cliff as you walk over it. Because if you don't, you're going to end up hurting yourself. You're going to end up just smacking face first into the, the side of the, the, the sheer drop as you kind of go over. And uh, so you have to kind of fall in, which means two things you have to trust. You have to learn to trust two things. One, you need to trust the rope, right? And the second thing is you need to be, trust the other person on the other end of the rope, right? <laughs> You need to trust them that they're not going to let you down, right? And that you can walk over backwards that cliff and keep your feet on the wall and then, you know, jump out. And, and again, if you, don't, if, if you don't trust them, you're going to mess up. You're going to end up flying face first into the side of that uh, cliff and you're going to hurt yourself because you're not going to have your feet in the right position and all those kinds of things. You're going to hurt yourself or somebody else. And so I've managed to do some things, despite my significant fear over the years, uh, because I learned to trust. I learned to trust that the, what the people were telling me is, is true, um, uh, and that the rope will hold, and that the people aren't going to just let me fall uh, down. And in the end, the reality is, is that our author of Hebrews today, and our passage today, is talking about this same kind of trust, right? This faith, having faith. Right? I had to have faith when I back over that cliff that that rope's going to hold and that the people are going to hold me on the other end. And that's kind of what the author of Hebrews is talking about in terms of our faith. That, that our faith and our trust is that God has got us. So let's take a look at what the authors of Hebrews is writing to them and to us today. So it begins with this definition of what faith is, uh, according to the authors of Hebrews. Faith is confidence and what we hope for, an assurance about what we do not see. Confidence in what we hope for, an assurance about what we do not see. Notice that faith here isn't really an intellectual thing, at least not entirely. Yes, there is some assent to certain truths, right? Believing in God as creator that they mentioned there, and that God is uh, going to reward folks and, and, and work, uh, you know, be working for their good and stuff like that. that. So there is a kernel of that, but usually, oftentimes we think of faith uh, as almost being exclusively about belief in like a set of things that we believe in. But here, faith, as I said here uh, last week, is that faith here is actually more of a trust, right? It's a confidence in our hope. And a hope isn't something, you don't hope for something you already have, right? You hope 
in um, something that is yet to come. And we fully trust the promises that God has given, um, those assurances that even though we don't see them yet, that we have been given in Christ Jesus. It's assurance about things we don't see yet, right? We have trust that those assurances are going to hold true, that even though the world around us may not look like the picture of what God has promised in Christ, right? Jesus said he came to initiate the kingdom of God, and we have some uh, illustrations of what that kingdom looks like throughout the, the uh, Bible. And while we may look at the world and say, well, it sure doesn't look like that yet, we still trust and have assurance that one day these promises are Christ, of Christ are going to hold true. The author then, after beginning with this definition of faith, goes on to give examples from the Old Testament, the author's scripture. We have to remember that they didn't have the New Testament yet. They were, he was literally writing part of it, right, as, as this is going on. And so uh, the scriptures for the author were the uh, Old Testament and goes on to describe several of the ancients, as he refers to them, as uh, being these people who showed this kind of faith, even though they never got to see the very promises of God that they were promised, right? So Abel, Noah, Enoch, which you may not know a lot about, but there's this little weird thing about him being carried up into heaven, right? All of these folks, each in their own way, trusted a promise that God had given them, even though they never got to see the total fulfillment of those promises in their own lifetime. And in fact, each of them went through many difficulties during, the, even though they were given promises. Uh, and despite each of these difficulties, each tried to live as if these promises were real in their lifetime. Probably the one, you know, maybe the, that's most uh, memorable for us is that of Abraham and Sarah, right? So Abraham left his home country and traveled to a land that he was promised and lived there, as he states here, as a nomad, right, in tents. And tents, because God promised him this land and, and promised him that he'd be the father of a great nation, and yet didn't really see either of those things in his lifetime. He did finally end up having a son by Sarah, uh, and as it says there, both of them were all practically dead when they had, you know, not necessarily the nicest way to talk about folks that are older, but that's what the writer of Hebrews says, right? Like that they uh, were near death, and yet somehow miraculously they had Isaac. But Abraham never got to see his son's children, right? He never got to see the, the, uh, the truth of Israel becoming to fruition, never got to see the promised land, never got to see homes built with foundations. He lived as a foreigner and as an alien in the land, uh, intense his whole life. He died before any of the promises were completely fulfilled, as were Isaac and Jacob, right, as it mentions us, to us. And so it is with people like uh, Noah and others that never got to see the full fulfillment, and yet they lived according to the promises, trusting in something that one day would be true, even though they never got to see it in their lifetime. Faith is the confidence in what we hope for and the assurance about what we do not see. And these are examples. So for us today, I think we need to continue to remind ourselves today because it is really easy to forget um, what true faith looks like for the church today just as much as it was difficult in the day that the book of Hebrews was written. We have to remember that they were going through difficult things and they were probably wondering where are these promises of Christ's return and they were probably wondering, why does it look like the Roman government is, you know, taking over things and look at all these bad things that are going on in the world around us and, you know, God, where are you? And all of those same questions that we might sometimes have in our lives today were going on in the first century. And perhaps too often today we think that everything is in danger, <laughs> right? That we're heading in the wrong direction, you know, uh, we have turned our backs on God, whatever it might be, and we might begin to lose hope because of those things. But here's the thing, friends, church. Faith is trusting in things we hope for. It's the assurance of things we do not see right now. That's what the author of Hebrews is reminding us. This means 
We need to go out and trust that God is at work in the world, even if we don't necessarily get it or see it, and that these promises, this promised reality of the coming kingdom of God, of Christ's return to make all things new, that that is assured, even if we don't necessarily see it as our current reality, where we live and how we live. We must trust that God has us, right? We have to be like that repeller stepping over the cliff, and it might look dangerous, and then we might wonder about the person who's got the other end of the rope, but no, it's God, and God's got us, right? We can step over that cliff and be secure, just as Abraham, just as Sarah, just as Noah, and all the rest of the ancients that are listed in this great uh, anthology of those of faith that have gone before us. We need to trust that God has got us and got this world, right? I mean, just think about the old VBS song we all used to sing, right? He's got the whole world in his hands. He's holding on to that rope. We can trust him. We need to trust that the future will be fulfilled just as God has said, and that God will be all in all, that one day every knee will bow and every tongue confess that he is Lord. Just all of those promises of Scripture that are there, that every tear will be wiped away, that God will be present among us. All of those things will come. And not only will they come, and not only should that be our hope and that we should continue to remember, but we need to also remember then because of that, we need to live our lives differently now. You see, Abraham didn't just hope. Sarah didn't just hope and have trust. Okay, God, that's great but I'm just going to sit here until you get it all done. They actually got up and went. And they lived and they moved around and they did the things that God called them to do. And they, yes, they messed up and they sinned and they fell short again and again, but then they got up and they tried again, right? That happened. All of these folks did. Noah didn't wait for it to start raining before he built a boat in a place that a boat shouldn't be, right? He went ahead and did it. And probably looked ridiculous doing it, right? As one commentator puts it, faith enables believers to live by a vision of reality of God and God's purposes for the earth. A vision that is not yet present or visible to the eye. Right? So we live with a version of our, with our faith as if these reality, this reality is true and real, even though that reality may not yet be visible to our eye. And then goes on to say, it empowers believers to move into the future with trust and confidence, knowing that the future belongs to God. The future belongs to God. God has got us. God's on the other end of the rope. We can take the leap of faith, if you want to call it that, Trusting as we repel down the side of the mountain we call life. Living according to God's ways. Why? Because we have confidence. Confidence and trust in the things that we don't see yet. I think that's a really important word for us uh, today. And notice it doesn't mean that life will be perfect or easy here and now. None of those uh, great uh, people of faith that are mentioned in the ancients had an easy life. None of them. They all went through hard things. They all died before they got to see the, the promises fulfilled. It doesn't mean we won't have struggles, but it means that we know that the truth of God will hold firm. I think it's an important message for us to hear at this time in our own nation, right? As we head to the polls on Tuesday, I encourage you all to go vote. But here's the thing, friends. It doesn't matter who wins on Tuesday because that's not who our hope is in. Right? Doesn't mean you shouldn't vote your conscience. It doesn't mean you can't be disappointed if your person doesn't win or whatever. But faith is not in the political system of the United States or who's president or who's in the Senate or other. It's in the Lord and the trusting in the promises of God. We need to remember that. We, know, we need to know and trust that one day all things will be made right. And then that should enable us then to go out with courage and live that faith out here and now. 
to love our neighbor as ourself, to even love our, our enemy and pray for those who persecute us. Not because we necessarily think we're going to get something from it here and now, but because we know and trust that one day that's the way reality is going to be. Right? So friends, might God help us to have strong faith, that we might have the ability to be confident in the hope that Christ has given us and trust in the things that we don't see right now, but know that one day they will be made reality. Amen and amen. Friends, our song of response is a communion hymn. Um, the words will be up here on the screen, but there's also an insert in the bulletin. This is not a hymn that's in our bulletin, but there is an insert uh, from Forest Avenue's hymnal, <laughs> uh, which I made a copy of for you all. Uh, and uh, if you want to see the music, it's there for you. But let's uh, sing this uh, Come Share the Lord together. So friends, now as we come together um, in giving of our tithes and offerings, let's remember all we have is a gift from God. Um, the plate is in the back. You can give on your way out. And those online, there are opportunities to give online uh, through the QR code. Let us give with thankful hearts. Road and the hill to the cross. 
us pray. Gracious God, we are thankful for the blessings that you have poured out upon each one of us and collectively as your church here at Hebron. We ask now that you would receive these, our tithes and our offerings, that they would be set aside for your purpose, your work, your will in this world, that indeed it is your kingdom that comes on earth as it is in heaven. We pray through Christ who is our Lord. Amen. Please be seated. As we come to the table, this table is a reminder of the promises that we are given. A reminder of the promises that we have been given in Christ Jesus through his life, his death, and his resurrection. And he reminds us that this table is not a Presbyterian table. It's not Hebron's table, but it's the Lord's table. And it's a foretaste of the coming, uh, 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 the coming meal that we will all enjoy together in the kingdom of God. It says they will come from north, south, east, and west to sit at the table with the Lord in the kingdom of God. And so this is a foretaste of that reality that we now take in hope of things we have not yet seen, right? As we come to the table. So all who place their faith and trust are welcome. Will you please uh, open your bulletins and get out the insert for the communion liturgy and then join with me. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. Right to give our thanks and praise. It is truly right and our greatest joy to give you thanks and praise, O Lord our God, creator and ruler of the universe. In your wisdom you made all things and sustained them by your power. You formed us in your image, setting us in this world to love and to serve you and to live in peace with your whole creation. When we rebelled against you, refusing to trust and obey you, you did not reject us, but still claimed us as your own. You sent prophets to call us back to your way. Then, in the fullness of time, out of your great love for the world, you sent your only Son to be one of us, to redeem us and to heal our brokenness. Therefore, we praise you, joining our voices with choirs of angels, with prophets, apostles, and martyrs, and with all the faithful of every time and place, who forever sing to the glory of your name. Christ, your Son, our Lord. In Jesus, born of Mary, your word became flesh and dwelt among us, full of grace and truth. He lived as one of us, knowing joy and sorrow. He healed the sick, fed the hungry, opened blind eyes, broke bread with outcasts and sinners, and proclaimed the good news of your kingdom to the poor and the needy. Dying on the cross, he gave himself for the life of the world. Rising from the grave, he won for us victory over death. Seated at your right hand, he leads us to eternal life. We praise you that Christ now reigns with you in glory and will come again to make all things new. Remembering your gracious acts in Jesus Christ, we take from your creation this bread and this cup and joyfully celebrate his dying and rising as we await the day of his coming. With thanksgiving, we offer our very selves to you to be a living and holy sacrifice dedicated to your service. Great is the mystery of faith. pray. 
Gracious God, pour out your Holy Spirit upon us and upon these your gifts of bread and juice, that the bread we break and the cup we bless may be the body and the communion of the blood of Christ. By your Spirit, make us one with Christ, that we may be one with all who share this feast, united in ministry in every place. As the bread is Christ's body for us, send us out to be the body of Christ in the world. In union with your church in heaven and on earth, we pray that you will fulfill your eternal purpose in us and in the world. Keep us faithful in your service until Christ comes in final victory, and we shall feast with all your saints in the joy of your eternal realm. Through Christ, with Christ, in Christ, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor are yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. Friends, Scripture reminds us that on the night that Jesus was betrayed, he was at supper with his disciples, and he took bread, and he gave thanks for it, and he blessed it, and then he broke it, and he said, this is my body, which is broken for you. Take of it and eat. Friends, this is the body of Christ broken for you. Let's take of it together. In the same way, after supper, Jesus took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant which is sealed in my blood, which is shed for the forgiveness of sins. As often as you drink of it, do so in remembrance of me. For friends, as often as we drink this cup and we eat this bread, we proclaim the saving death of our risen Lord until he comes again.
Friends, this is the cup of the new covenant. Let us take it together. Let's join in the unison communion prayer. Gracious God, you have met us and fed us with the bread and the cup. As our bodies are nourished with holy food, so may our spirits be nourished by your presence. Help us to listen to your Son, Jesus, to heed his word and to seek his will as the Lord of our lives. In his name we pray to you. Amen. Now, as we come to our time of prayer, I ask for uh, prayer updates. Uh, we have a Thanksgiving. Uh, so Anderson is here after last week asking for prayer. It was uh, pneumonia. The x-ray confirmed, and thankfully the antibiotics did their job, and he's been able to be in school all week, so we're thankful for that, um, for Anderson getting better. and. Everything. So thanks for your prayers for that. Any other updates, uh, praises, thanksgivings, prayer requests? Yeah. Phyllis? My sister Janice is here with me today, but I also wanted to pray for Jason. His operation will be Friday, and he was operated on in Jefferson Hospital for his hip and his vertebrae side as well. Right. So, yeah, welcome, Janice. It's good that you're here. We're thankful for that. But pray for Jason and uh, his upcoming surgery, the significant surgery. And you said Friday, right? Yeah. Yeah, Janice. I want to just thank the people here at this church for all your prayers for me. And I thank God I'm cancer-free and in remission. And, and God is so good. And I, I love this church. And my sister always sends me your bulletin, your sermons, and what you're doing. And God bless you all. Thank you. Yeah. It's wonderful. Any other prayer requests or prayers? Uh, I'll just I'll offer so a prayer for the election on Tuesday and that everything would just run smoothly and the poll workers and everybody would be a safe, fair, and free election. That's all we're praying for, right? Yeah, June. I want to thank God for other Christians at the place where I'm staying uh, that um, I can work with. Um, but particularly one person is a musician and she wants to do Christmas music. Yes. And gather some other people and practice. Wonderful. <laughs> and then two, two other people want to go to the Bible study with me. That's wonderful. That's wonderful community. That's good. Any others? All right, well, let's go to God in prayer. Holy and gracious God, we pray that uh, and give thanks for all that you have done for us, both individually and collectively as your church, and for the opportunity to bring our prayers to you. So we lift these up, trusting in you and hoping in you. Give thanks that Anderson uh, was able to get the medicine that he needed and that it, it uh, had such a wonderful impact on healing him so quickly that he was able to go to school all week. And thank you for the prayers for him. Lord, in your mercy, hear are our prayers. And we do uh, give thanks for Janice being able to be here with Phyllis today. And we are very thankful to hear of her remission from cancer. And um, we're just thankful for all of the prayers of this community and other communities that have been supporting her and upholding her in prayer. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. And Lord, we lift up Jason and his upcoming surgery on Friday. We pray that it would be successful in what it needs to do. We pray for full healing and recovery for him and that they would... Uh, that he would be able to uh, live well uh, and that this would bring healing to his body. Be with him and all those performing the surgery. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. Lord, we do lift up our coming election in this country. We know that our hope is in you, but we do pray for just a peaceful and um, 
uh, fair and free election and that uh, folks would get out and vote and that you would be with our poll workers and everybody else and that it would just be uh, an expression of our love for neighbor, Lord, as we go to the polls and that we remember that in the end we're all on the same team, uh, that we're all members of this community and that we should uh, seek to love our neighbors as ourselves. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. And Lord, we pray uh, and give thanks for June's experience at our new uh, uh, living residence and are thankful for the Christians that she has found that have come together and uh, want to do Bible study together, want to do music together and bless the, uh, the place where they're living uh, with those gifts and skills. And we just pray that you would just continue to build that community there and that it might be a light uh, for you and a place of uh, love and caring community. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. Lord, continue to be with us uh, and help us in our times of need. And now hear us as we join our voices together, saying the words that Jesus taught. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us now our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and power and the glory forever. Amen. Our closing hymn of praise is In Christ There Is No East or West, which is number 285 in the hymnal. Let's stand together and sing as we're able. So, friends, now as we go out into the world, uh, may we remember the hope that we have been given in Christ Jesus, right? And may our faith be that trust, that trust, even in the things that we don't see yet, right? The promises that have been made that we may not see in the world, but we are to live as if they're true here and now. That's our calling as the church, to be a signpost to be an example of the coming community that one day will be made whole in Christ Jesus, but we are to be examples of that here and now. No matter what's going on out there, we're to try and be examples of that reality here and now. So may we go knowing the grace and the peace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the steadfast love of God the Father that endures even when we fall short. He's got us on the other end of the rope. We can take the leap. And may we be brought together in the communion of the Holy Spirit that binds us together and now sends us out into the world to be those loving agents of Christ's kingdom out there. One God, now and forever. Friends, may we go in peace. Amen. Amen.